So we're going to spend a few minutes talking with Charles before we have the, uh, the uh, panel discussion. By the way, the, the online viewership today was four to five, wow. which is amazing. And we were able to secure the insulin for Charles also. <laughs> so thanks to all of you who made your contribution. He's been without insulin for three weeks. And anyone who's diabetic, you know that is not a good idea. Um, not because he wanted to, but just because he, he just couldn't afford it. Okay. So we spoke this morning about your case and about how this set of circumstances just seemed to work together. And we just wanted to sort of tease it out a little bit more. So your childhood was abusive. Yeah. Your stepfather was cruel. Yeah. To put and, it and I know that you see the good in things, but tell us a little growing up what, what that was like for you and your mom. Um, well, my stepfather was, uh, yeah, my stepfather, uh, Herbert Lewis, was uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I've come to understanding o over the years. Uh, he, he grew up without his mother, and he didn't have a lot of love in his household, and he really didn't know how to love, so he was uh, very abusive. He was uh, verbally and physically abusive. And there were times when you didn't have to go to the emergency room. Yeah. Because of physical injury. Yeah. And as a result of the treatment, you started ripping and running the streets. Yeah, I found that uh, for some reason or another, any place but home was some place I'd rather be. You were just seeking refuge. Yeah. And... Uh, you got yourself into a lot of trouble. I did. You began to carry guns. I did. Want to talk a little about that? Uh, well, that's an interesting story that you probably didn't hear about. Uh, anyway, one day my, my stepfather had beat my mother severely, pretty bad, and we left and went to Walmart and she bought a gun and she gave it to me. I think I was about 13 at the time to hold on to. That's 13 years old. Yeah. So, you know, like my 13-year-old brain didn't register what this was about. So uh, I couldn't wait to go out and show it to all my friends and buddies. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, I got my first gun from my mother. Uh, and, uh, and the purpose of that gun was to defend yeah. yourself and, to some extent, your mother. Yeah. She ended up shooting him with the gun, too, eventually. Uh, I think it was about 14 then when uh, she shot him. And uh, they still stayed together, you know, so. So the deck was really stacked against you? Uh, I guess you could say that, yeah. And the night in question, with that um, killing of the off-duty police officer, the crime that you were charged with. Yeah. Where were you? I was playing at the local 212 on uh, Mac and Connors in Detroit. You were playing a gig? Yeah. And when I looked at the case file and reviewed the records from the um, prosecutor's office and the police officers, they all said that you could not have committed the crime based on not just eyewitness testimony, but based on the testimony of, of one of the other police officers. Yeah, the, the, uh, the police officer that was killed, his partner was an eyewitness to the murder. I mean, like an eye eyewitness. Like he said, he saw him get shot and fall in the street. And he saw the guy who shot him, and the guy who shot him got arrested an hour later. And he was released an hour after he got arrested. And when they investigated the case, they never checked your alibi. You were supposed to be playing at a gig. They never interviewed them. Well, one of the things that happened that worked against me was my attorney was a mob lawyer. And so uh, my attorney was not trying to find anything. His job was to make sure that I got convicted. 
So the three guys who said that you committed the crime, yeah. they went free, they walked. Never they did a day. Never, never did one did day. It. Not one day. Yeah. And you went to prison in 1976. 76. Yeah. And at that time, I thought it was 1978. I got arrested in, I got convicted in 77, but I got arrested in 76. Arrested in 76, convicted in yeah. 1977. And your sentence was? Uh, 40 to 60 and life without the possibility of parole. Without the possibility of parole. Right. So you're in prison, you're a young guy, you're a child. Yeah. And you're in prison. And then what? Um, and then I got to convince the general population that I'm not going to be nobody's girlfriend or any of that. So um, I had to fight. You had to fight? A lot of fights. You had to defend yourself. Yeah. And by defending yourself, you were building a record that you were a terrible dude and not worthy of Not, not really parole. so much that, but just No, the that. point I'm making is sort of like a double jeopardy, right? Yeah. You had to defend yourself. Yeah. But as you defend yourself, you ended up committing crimes in prison by defending yourself. Um, I, I don't really think that's a good way to characterize it. Like prison is, uh, here's, here's, here's what you have to understand about prison. It's an unusual environment. Mm -hmm. And the rules of society don't work in prison. So you can't function in prison with the same rules that you function with out here. Like in, in prison, uh, you pretty much have to show that, you, that you're strong and that you're not going to allow anybody to run over you. And so you also have to, at the same time, have to show that you're not going to run to the officers and tell on people because that's a whole nother set of problems that you encounter by doing that. You know, so uh, you, you, you pretty much have to stand your ground and you have to show people that you're going to fight no matter what. So now here's a good thing. Uh, I guess about 20 years old, I'd had about 20 or 30 fights under my belt and I had a reputation as a guy that would fight. So now I can go and get my GED and then I can go to college and not really have any of the other problems that other guys dealt with, you know. So that's how I was able to uh, get a job in the law library and uh, read books. And books became like my outlet, you know. Uh, Claude Brown, uh, Man, Child in the Promised Land was my favorite book. And um, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, I would just read. And so through reading, I would escape. And then through college, college helped me to understand that there was a world that existed that I didn't know anything about. You know, like I took up a French class and I had no idea what Paris was about, you know, or, you know, that there, were, there was a world outside of Gratiot and Jefferson, you know. And so uh, once I began to discover that, you know, I, I began to, to really make some miraculous changes in my life. God is amazing too, because during this time, I also began playing the piano for some guys who sang in church, and I, I developed a deep relationship with God. Not a relationship with the church per se, but a relationship with God. And so I, I knew that no matter what I was going through, that God had me, you know. No matter what problems I had, God had me, you know. So, did you ever take music classes? No. No music classes? No. But you're an, an accomplished musician. I don't know about accomplished, but I play a well, little bit. Well, <laughs> well, hang on, Trevor. Can you roll that, uh, that uh, tape for um, a minute, please? Um, so, so uh, while in prison, you made music. Yeah. And in fact, with a recently con concluded trial, you sent one of your CDs to Judge Lilliard. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to listen to some of, the, of your music. And this is just a sort of a small sample. And then I, I said to you, well, all of these instruments were like different people playing these different instruments. And tell the church what you told me. No, I played everything myself, everything on the piano. Uh, I did all the horns and strings on the piano, and uh, I played the guitar over it. Because if I had to define myself, I would say that I'm a 
a jazz guitar player if I had to define myself. But uh, I love so many genres of music. Like all of the songs they were singing, I knew all of those songs. Wow. Uh, you know, I knew turnarounds, I knew everything because those were songs that I played in church. So you're probably a musical genius. <laughs> and I'm being very serious, right? You're probably a musical genius who never got that opportunity because it was snatched away from you. Yeah. How come you're not angry with the world? Well, I learned pretty early in prison. That I was angry for a long time in prison, about 10 years. And, and I began to realize that anger destroys people. Um, so when you get mad at somebody and you get angry, it doesn't hurt them. It hurts you. And so if you want to grow, you got to get past the anger and you got to let that go. Yeah. You, you can't be angry and grow. Uh, so if I was out here in society and I was angry, I would never be able to do what I'm doing now. I would have never been able to fly here. I would never be able to talk to the congregation to perhaps touch somebody's heart and perhaps change somebody's life. I would never be able to do that if I was angry. So you, know. so you spend the time pulling yourself up by your bootstrap. Yeah. Can we have a sample of, of the music? you record that selection in prison? Uh, first, I got to say this, as I'm listening to it, I, I'm reflecting on where I was at and what I was doing then. Music was my escape. Uh, it, it, you know, like you said, uh, how come you're not angry? Music was my way out. Uh, like I would, I was fortunate, I was blessed to, when I got to Macomb, the chaplain, uh, made me the keyboard player and the leader of the praise team. And so uh, in the process of that, all day I had access to the keyboard and a, a tape recorder. And what I would do is I would just uh, go in the room and just zone out. It was like, it, that was my way of uh, leaving prison. And so uh, that, that was how I dealt with it, you know. Uh, that was just how I dealt with it. Tell us a little about your educational achievements while in prison. Well, uh, I got my GED probably a month after I got to prison. Uh, maybe two months, I don't know, a few months. A few months after I got to prison, I got my GED. But then when I, when, I, when I got arrested, I only needed five classes to graduate. So I was like one semester away from graduating when I got arrested. But uh, I got my GED and I decided that, uh, then I got a job in the, in the, in the library. And uh, I'm, I'm reading this book by Claude Brown, Man, Child in the Promised Land. And he's talking about going to college and becoming a lawyer. And I was like, wow, man, I'm impressed by this, this is what I wanna do. So uh, I signed up for college. They had a, 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 what they called College Opportunity Prison Extension. And that was my comp community college. And so uh, I took up like freshman English and biology and French and a bunch of other classes, uh, political science. And uh, the amazing thing about college was college helped me to, to realize that there was so much more to life than what I had been exposed to. And, uh, and, and then I've developed some weird goals. You know, I wanted to get out and I wanted to run for political office and I was gonna change the system and I, was, I had all these lofty goals. Uh, you know, I was gonna change the system. I'm gonna get out, I'm gonna run for a state representative and I'm gonna write some bills and this ain't gonna never happen to nobody else, you know. But life got in the way and uh, that, that didn't happen. But, you know, as a result of going to college, it, it definitely helped me to, uh, think on another level. And, uh, 
And, and, and the most difficult thing about that was, it, I'm from the east side of Detroit. And when I first came to prison, the whole, most of the prison system was from my neighborhood, guys that I knew, guys that I went to school with. Uh, and so as I began to go to college, you know, things like uh, the, the, the race for the presidency and uh, current events became important to me. They weren't important to my homeboys. So I began to realize that the, the more I learned and the more I grew, the more I had to cut off friends who wasn't really trying to go there, who wasn't really trying to learn, who wasn't trying to grow. And, and that was difficult, you know. That, that was real difficult. And, and I think that it's probably like that out here in life too, that as you begin to grow and advance, the people that are not growing with you and not advancing with you, you gotta let them go in order for you to keep moving. You also started a, a master's program also? Yeah, I was, I was uh, oh man, that's one of my proudest achievements. Uh, I took the test and uh, it, I was in it in what they called an accelerated master's program. But what happened to me was I kept going back to court because I kept filing motions and uh, the judge would grant a motion and he would call me back to court. I'd be in the middle of a semester. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, so anyway, I ended up getting uh, kicked out of the master's program because I kept going back to court and I couldn't finish, complete those uh, semesters when I went back to court. How many times did you appeal, appeal your case? Man, I, I appealed till I got out. I, I think I had filed some motions a couple I, weeks I saw before some, I got out. I saw some of your motions. <laughs> you know, so I appealed all the way till I walked out the door. So, so here, and for those of us who are here, it was very an interesting yeah. walk for me, you know, looking into the legal system. Um, and there are some systemic problems, and you're running for a Washington um, prosecutor, you know, and I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're here, so some of the things that you can look into, you know, we, we only ask for fairness, that's all, not, not favoritism. When I looked at your case, and I researched uh, the 2012 ruling of um, Miller v. Um, Alabama, Alabama yeah where um, um, Judge Keegan opined that it's um, unusual and cruel punishment to incarcerate a child yeah. without parole if they're rehabable. And Michigan, as I said this morning, has over 360 juvenile lifers. We're third in the nation. So there's somewhere, I don't know, maybe 15, 17,000 juvenile lifers. Since that ruling of 2012, those juvenile lifers are still in prison unless they had the resources to appeal their sentence in. Yeah. Uh, Think about that for a minute. Yeah, they, they, you know, the changes in the law, unfortunately, don't automatically... Uh, Trickle down, that's a good way to characterize it. Uh, I think for me, it was, it was persistence. It, it, I think the ruling came out in June of 2012, and I filed my first motion in July of 2012. You know, so uh, my resentencing was granted, and uh, I, I was headed out the door, and unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know how they did it, but I ended up getting a different judge. So it went from the judge who, uh, we had pretty much essentially said over the phone that he was gonna let me go to Judge Lillard who kept me an additional five years. And uh, Now, and on top of all of that, on the day of the trial, we battled with the, with the prosecutor and even though we presented evidence that, that you were taking decided steps to improve your life, yeah. educationally, socially, and within the prison milieu, that prosecutor was still hell-bent on sending you or on, on keeping you in the system yeah. for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because of what I represent. Unfortunately, I, 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 I represent uh, the person who continues to fight. See, if everybody continued to fight, we wouldn't have a system. If, if, if everybody filed and everybody did what they could to get out, it would be difficult to run the system. They, we would bankrupt the system. 
So, you know, they wanted to discourage those coming behind me from doing what I did. You know what I'm saying? See, now that I'm out on the street, it's guys, you know, walking the yard in prison saying, I'm going to be like Charles Lewis. I'm going to file some motions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know. And so that's what they didn't want. They didn't want guys to step up and start fighting. I know that we don't have a whole lot of time, yeah. and, um, um, but you, you're out. What is the adjustment like? Because when you went in, there, there was no internet, there were no cell phone, there was no yeah. Instagram, text messages, blah, 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 cash app. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that. Yeah. So, so how, how, how have you made that adjustment? How are you adjusting? And by the way, when you were released after 43 years, you got no compensation. No, so I didn't get a dime. You're essentially broke. Yeah. Homeless. No financial yeah. platform. God is good. God is amazing. Um, uh, Pastor Cox, he got me a job as soon as, uh, it's about 30 days after I got out. But after, uh, the job made me a, uh, no, it's, it's, it's more to this story. You need to hear this. It's more to this story. You know, uh, when I got out, I was 60 years old. Uh, and my 60-year-old body just simply couldn't perform the tasks that were needed to be performed. And so uh, I, I, I did that 15-hour shift, and I walked out of there. Actually, I stumbled out and kind of rolled out, you know. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, I got in the car and went home and, and just got in bed. I didn't even take a shower or take my clothes off or nothing. I just laid in the bed. And I realized that, uh, I, I said to myself, I don't think slaves work that hard, you know, doing slavery, you know. So uh, I realized at that point that I had some physical challenges at 60 that I didn't have at 17. You know, at 40 years old, I could have did the job with no problem. At, at 60 years old, it, it was a little too demanding for me. And I had to accept that. Uh, uh, and, and that was a little difficult, it was, it was, it was ego, uh, it, it dealt with my ego, you know, it was a blow to my ego that I couldn't physically perform that job. Uh, but God is good and I'm pretty sure that uh, he's gonna get me another job, you know, so. So I think, um, I, think I, have, I have this feeling that we're gonna adopt you. <laughs> yeah. And I'm serious. Yeah. I just have this feeling that we're gonna adopt you. Yeah. It was our privilege to host you in our home, you and the group, Two weeks ago, we had no idea that this was going to happen. It just yeah. started falling into place like a series of random events. Yeah. All of a sudden, a lot of people show up in our house, sleeping wherever. <laughs> and the party continues tonight. I hear yeah. to cut, to cut our interview short. But Kevin, you have a question. And one or two of you may have some quick questions. Go ahead, Kevin. lost money and people, people in your, your case should get financial compensation because you, because you were convicted for a crime which you, which you didn't commit. Let me answer the question, Kevin. So Charles has not been exonerated. Charles has not been exonerated. His but sentence... If, it, if, if the police... We have a, we have a system. There, is a, there, there, there are some systemic issues that we, I guess, the panel... The panel is going to get into those systemic issues. But just for your own understanding, he's not been exonerated. His sentence has been commuted. So, so what the judge did, when the judge resentenced him, the judge resentenced him to 33 years in prison. 37 to 60. 37 years in prison. So because he had already served 43 years, he was released based on that, and because of that, the state is not obligated to do anything for you. But in the original case, if a police officer who saw his colleague shot, did not say so Charles was not the person who shot his police officer, how is Charles not able to, 
to, to get out? How's the child not able to be exonerated and get the money which he rightly deserves and life, some, some kind of life back which, 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 he, which he needs? So the original prosecutor who tried Charles was present at a resentencing. I met him. He did not even remember Charles. Charles was just another number of notch in his belt. So the fact that a police officer said, this is not the guy, the fact that he was playing at a gig, the fact that there was no substantial evidence except three guys who said, he shot the guy. Th those things don't matter with our system. And once you've been sentenced, unless there's DNA evidence, right, your sentence is not going to be overturned. So there is no compensation for him. There is nothing for him. His life has been taken away, and that's how the system works. Not even hindsight. No. Not even the judge who commuted the sentence could undo what was done. But the panel will get into those legal and social issues, but just to answer your question. That's how our system works. And our system is based on a plea deal system, just so that we know. So if you are arrested, you don't have to be guilty, but it depends on the ferocity of the prosecutor and the police officers. And oftentimes, you're given options. You can take your chances, you can roll the dice, and you can go before a jury, right? And you can take 15 to life or 25 to life, or I can just give you probation. Which one are you going to choose? You're going to choose probation, right? I will choose probation. The problem with that is, when you're on probation, you do not have to commit a crime to go back to going to prison. You just have to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You just have to arrive home late. You just have to miss the bus and not keep your probation appointment. You just have to forget to tell the probation officer that because you were evicted, you had to move to a different address. You don't have to commit a crime. That's how the system works. It's horrible. But time out. We got to go. Winston, last question. I just want to know if you can vote. I registered. I don't know if they You uh, can run for the president now. <laughs> I would ask you to. Guys, we are sorry, but we are out of time. The, the, the panel is ramped up and all over me. Sorry. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Well, that was an excellent segue into the panel. So at this time, if I could have all of those that are participants um, on the panel to please come forward. Pardon me? Do you? Oh. Well, please do come forward. Yes. All right. So we do have another one here, but we will need another one. Um, my other guest is coming a tad late. Um, sadly, she had a class to attend. Yes. Well, all right, the more the, yeah. Um, but you can definitely kind of um, add to the discussion. I'm just loving the fact that we have so many that are invested in this topic um, because we've definitely talked about it prior um, and I think that the more that we keep it before the church, in time, we will be a church that will move um, and be able to make some levels of systemic change since we're talking about social justice level issues. So at this time, we're going to just simply start by um, you introducing yourself, 
um, and what your profession or just kind of association is with this particular topic. And we'll start here. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tony Hunt. And what I may be able to add to this discussion is that I did work for six years in the uh, correctional institution. So I've had some firsthand looks at what it's like to be incarcerated, uh, firsthand looks at situations that uh, inmates, as well as officers, as well as just general people, uh, have uh, in, re in regards to uh, the correctional system. Good evening, everyone. My name is Keith Jones. I am a mental, well, my class, well, my title is mental health social worker in a prison, uh, but I do uh, much more than that, uh, as most social workers do. We kind of cover the board. So uh, while responsible for mental health treatment, I also uh, set up uh, Medicaid disability. I run, I assist with uh, the dialysis clinic with the inmates who are being released and will need, continue to need services. So while I'm setting up medical services, mental health services, I also arrange dialysis as well as all the max outs that are coming back to the Wayne County area. I find placement for all these guys. So I do a lot of things as stated. So um, I also get to work with parolees and also <laughs> act as an unofficial gatekeeper because I push some guys back out if, if the judges are willing and uh, workable. Some guys, we can find alternative programming or um, alternate plans. So uh, I started working with juvenile detention first, then I moved up to working with the adults. And in a nutshell, that's what I do. And so Keith, how often do you see young people that were in the juvenile justice system um, in which you assisted at one point to actually interface with you again? All the time. I actually have one that was on my personal pod actually working as my assistant right now. <laughs> yeah. okay. But fortunately, he violated his parole, not because he necessarily committed another crime. Once I read why, because I was going, I was going to wring his neck, um, because he knows better. Yeah. But once I found out why he, why he was there, he went back to a foster care home. It did not work out there. He ran away. He broke into an abandoned home and was arrested for breaking an area. So he's, technically he's ready to be released, but I, this time we're going to make sure he's in a place where he's going to be able to stay, thrive, survive. And so unfortunately, I see a lot of guys that were in juvenile who get out and they do not make it. Okay. All right, I just kind of wanted to add that piece. All right, next. Uh, my name is Eli Savitt. Uh, most pertinently, I'm running for Washtenaw County Prosecutor in the upcoming 2020 election. I'll flag that I'm running to be a very different type of prosecutor than uh, the one you had. Uh, my, my, my background, I started my career actually as an eighth grade teacher. I taught special education and general education classes. Uh, then went to law school. Over the course of my legal career, I've done every number of cases, including representing criminal defendants up on appeal uh, who had been wronged by the system down below. My day job currently uh, is I serve as senior legal counsel for the city of Detroit, where I oversee thousands of cases uh, that we bring in the public interest. I also serve as a law professor over at the University of Michigan. Go blue. Um, go blue. <laughs> I'm going to end with that. <laughs> How's it going, folks? My name is Edward Dance. Um, I am a college grad that just recently came back to the community. I um, got especially interested in criminal justice reform. In fact, I interned at the Washington County Public Defender's Office for six year, for six months. And I had a little bit too much experience there, but anyways. Um, <laughs> I really found a passion for advocating for those individuals who can't advocate for themselves, specifically with the institutions that currently exist and the institutions that especially uh, are prevalent within Washington County when it comes down to 70 percent uh, recidivism rate. And uh, I really felt that it was my duty to do whatever I can to ensure that the future will be more prosperous for those people who were misfortuned by just like uh, coercive plea bargains and other circumstances that they had no control over. So that drawed me to uh, Eli Savage's campaign as deputy campaign manager and 
I really believe that uh, if we all work together as a community, we can really make a positive change for these people and people like Mr. Lewis over there and make sure they actually get a chance when they're dealing with individuals like prosecutors who often hold all the cards. Yeah, yeah. And that's the uh, reason why I'm here. And yeah, that's all I can really say. And I'm about to go to law school hopefully next year and right. possibly get involved in the process of doing something about this. So thank you very much for having me here. He didn't mention he's a Spartan, though, so. Oh, no. Nah. <laughs> I was kind of like, you know, I was kind of go low-key. So. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. My name is Roy Williamson. Uh, I'm currently retired, thank God. I worked, <laughs> I worked for 19-plus years in the New York City Department of Correction, Rikers Island, and trust me, seen a lot. Thank you. Well, he said, I was a supervisor. I had the privilege of being a supervisor and a privilege also of being, but you have to be an officer be before you become a supervisor. But as a supervisor, you get to see a lot more of exactly some of the things that you probably wouldn't experience as an officer and some of the privilege that you can, the power that you have in your hands that you can do that you might not have as an officer. And we're gonna tell you more as, as the panel goes on. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Chaplain Stephen Cox. I'm a chaplain with the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office. Um, I provide uh, crisis intervention counseling for the inmates and also the officers at the, uh, the facility. Um, I'm also a social justice advocate and uh, my wife and I, we own and operate a nonprofit organization called Start of a New Day, which in Atlanta, Georgia, which uh, provides supportive uh, housing for ex offenders that are coming out of prison. All right, and so my other guest actually made it. We're so super excited. All right, so I have her introduce herself. All right, hi, everybody. My name is Alicia Dyer. I uh, was a former. Uh, police officer at the Washington County Sheriff's Office for seven years. I grew up in Ypsilanti, um, and I'm currently now going back to school to get a master's degree from uh, University of Michigan um, in social work and uh, public policy. All right. So welcome to everyone again. Um, so we're just going to kind of jump in. Uh, Chaplain Cox, if you could just briefly kind of give us some of those stats, the higher level stats that you had started out your presentation with this morning so that we can kind of put that into context, looking at the dis uh, disproportionality of um, incarceration. Before we go into the stats, um, I think it's necessary for us to get a kind of a history as to um, prisons in the United States of America. Why prisons? Um, in the 18th century, uh, prisons in America were used to house only so-called white offenders. Uh, there were no so-called black people in prisons. Anybody tell me why? Black people were, <laughs> black people were in the prisons called slavery. <clears throat> um, after the um, after um, 1865, um, the abolition of slavery, there was an amendment to the Constitution that said, neither slavery nor involuntary, involuntary servitude, except in the punishment for a crime where the, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist in the United States of America. So what this clause did, 13th Amendment, everybody knows this, has allowed America to continue to enslave minorities legally for the past 150 years. All right, so uh, going into some stats. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, America has about 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated people, the highest incarceration rate in the world. Something is wrong. The United States population is about, has about 325 million people. China has about 1.3 billion people, but with almost half the prison population of the United States of America. Something is wrong. America has the highest incarceration rate in the world with an estimated two million people held in federal, state, and private prisons, jails all across the nation. These prisons as a whole 
legally generate over $5 billion in revenue every single year through housing offenders and through the inmate workforce, uh, producing anything from road signs, mattresses, uh, commercial furniture, DMV operators. You got Starbucks, you got Victoria's Secrets, you got a lot of these private corporations that use in prison labor, uh, which is cheap because they pay these guys nothing about 15 cents uh, an hour of free wage. An estimated six million prisoners are under some sort of adult correctional supervision. You got 41% of American juveniles have been either arrested and convicted of a crime before they even reach the age of 23 years old. Children as young as 13 years old have been sentenced to die in prison. Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Louisiana, these states have the highest incarceration population with the highest number of inmates. I'm going to stop there with the stats because I can go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. And so since we've kind of gotten a tad bit of context there, here's the first question for the panel. How do you see systemic racism at work within the prison industry? From your purview, where do you see systemic racism at work in the prison industry? I'll start with that. I'm sure everybody probably got a, something to add to that. Uh, from my point of view, and like I said, I did work in the prison system for six years. However, I do have some other experiences that I could probably lend to this. Um, I worked at a program where I was the director of behavior modification where I dealt with young kids. Systemic racism, and I think it's poverty related, financially related, for those of us who can't afford, um, how do I want to put this? I guess af afford some of the um, privileges or benefits that a normal person should have. I don't know if you want to try to define normal, but my, my, my point of view here is, is that early on in life, I see mothers who are chasing checks, paychecks or chasing welfare checks, or chasing some type of support checks. And this is usually tied to some type of uh, mental issues with their kids. And if they get, take their kids in to get treatment, or they take their kids for routine uh, treatment with the state, oftentimes they are paid some type of subsistence or something to to aid them. And, and, and I think just because of the small amount of money, the dollars, they keep their families involved, or their children involved in receiving psychotropic medicines, which in turn gets them financial assistance, which in turn tags the child, which in turn make them a problem in the school, which in turn um, turns it around to the point where you've been identified as a problem in the school system and now you have been in the juvenile justice system or social justice system, if you will, where again the state chimes in to aid or to help. It's, it's, it's like it's just something that just from, from, from childhood that pulls you in as a parent and child and continues to grow with you until you become an adult. And I, I've dealt with kids at ages 12, 13, 14, 15 years old who's been in the system all their life. And now they're moving, and, I, and I've been to court plenty of times where we're trying to keep a child at home and they're trying to advance a kid in a different program. We're doing our utmost with probation officers to monitor, to guide, and to try to supervise, but it gets to the point to where something happens and they graduate to the next level, to the next level. And eventually, the level goes to prison. Um, and I have to say, uh, from your question, primarily, that happens to the blacks. <laughs> all right, all right. Anyone else on that question? How do you see systemic racism working in the prison industry? So, so, so I can provide my thoughts on it. Um, you know, there's, there's at least three ways and it starts it starts really from the time a kid's in school and it goes all the way into the that school to prison pipeline at every step along the way you see racism present 
in our system. And that's through a few things. One is implicit bias, two is explicit bias, and three is just this country's legacy of government-sponsored racism. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll just talk a, a little bit about how this affects everything. I mean, people can and have written books on this, so you know, we could just have a panel discussion for hours okay. just on this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's start with implicit bias, which starts when kids are really young. Mm -hmm. So let's break that down just for the young people in the audience sure. as well. Can you just, you know, simplistically break down implicit and explicit bias? Yeah, so, so, so explicit bias is basically being an overt racist, like, like straight up saying black people should be treated differently than white people, right? And, and that's what, you know, the person saying it believes. Implicit bias is different. Implicit bias is when people subconsciously treat uh, black people different than white people or different races different and it can fall along other lines too religious sexual orientation I mean sex all that, but it's but it's not intentional and But despite the fact that it's not intentional It's still it devastating That's right. because you look at when a kid enters school the uh, suspension rates for black kids for doing the same kind of stuff as white kids is like four or five times that of, of, of a white kid. And I can say this too. I, I went to high school and I were pioneer just down the road. And I remember this. I got in a fight with my black friend, right? Because we were teenagers and we got in a fight at school. We got in a disagreement. I don't even remember what the disagreement was about. We were both fighting. He got suspended and I didn't. And you see that systemically through the system. Uh, black youth are more likely to be referred to the criminal justice system for the same type of behavior than are white people. Um, and some of that's explicit bias. Some of it's like straight up treating people differently because of race, but some of it's implicit bias. When they get there, they're often overcharged, right? They're charged differently than a similarly situated white person, you know? Uh, um, Relatively non-serious adolescent behavior, a, a white kid is drinking in the park with friends, right? The prosecutor might say, I'm dropping the charges, I'm not going to bring those, here's a civil infraction, go on your way. And yet, you see people of color being treated differently, and so you see how this system affects everything. But the other thing uh, is the legacy of historic discrimination in this country across a whole host of systems. One thing that we have uh, in, in our justice system is, is the cash bail system, right? And what the cash bail system is, is it's a system in which if you're arrested for a crime, you're, before anything happens to you, before a, a jury or a judge makes any determination of your guilt, you're held pending trial unless you can come up with a certain amount of money out of your pocket to buy your way out, right? And it's not based on dangerousness, it's not based on the threat you pose to the community, it's based on how much money you have. Now think about this. What that means is a wealthy person who uh, actually poses a threat to the community, and I'll, I'll tell you this, wealthy white guy in Connecticut just yesterday was arrested and charged with kidnapping his ex-wife and brutally murdering her. He is free today on $6 million cash bond because he had $6 million to pay. Down the street here in Detroit, this is a real case. There was a black man who was held in jail for a week and missed his first day of work at his job because he wasn't able to pay $200 cash bail. You wanna know what the crime he was charged with was? Riding his bicycle on the sidewalk. And so, but, but and, and here in Washtenaw County, by the way, you are 8.5 times more likely to be held in jail because you're unable to pay your cash bail if you are black than if you are white. And that maps on to the socioeconomic inequities that we have in this country, which in turn map on to the legacy of intentional discrimination by our government because the government for, for, for decades and centuries put up barriers to home ownership, to education, redlining, right, that made it impossible for black people to obtain jobs or to build wealth. And then, you know, if you're a guy riding your bike down the sidewalk in Detroit, you're arrested, you don't have $200 to pay to get your way out, whereas that wealthy guy in Connecticut that murdered his, is accused of murdering his wife, is out on six 
million dollars. So putting money at the center of our criminal justice system is systemic racism, and it's something that we absolutely need to change. Yeah. So I can actually provide like context to that in of itself. Vast majority of um, defendants that we took care of were individuals who couldn't afford to, uh, well, get a lawyer. They're indigent. So basically, you had individuals who were wealthier who were able to afford um, top-notch attorneys, and they usually got off with lesser sentences. And sometimes the public defenders. Um, were forced into situations is based off of uh, lack of resources and time with each client. Uh, they basically just uh, kind of gave them course of plea bargains, and unfortunately, they were just kind of put in those situations where they couldn't <laughs> get out of it. And, and uh, often, and I, I would say way too often, there were just people who were, well, unfortunately, not given the deal that they could have gotten just based off of the fact that the attorney that we had assigned to their case couldn't get to them in time. They were usually scattered with like 10 billion different cases and that was just in of itself an example of what's wrong with our system. It's systemic racism and it's just it's going to take all of us to really bring to light these issues and try to point them out because if we don't I, I just don't see this, uh, this system changing so that's all I can really say. Totally agree with a lot of part of what you just said. Um, I don't see the system changing. And the reason why I agree with that as a social justice advocate, um, everything that you've just outlined is pretty much the fruit of the problem, but it's not the root of the problem. And to address the root of the problem, I would imagine that you would have to be connected to probably a Rothschild or a Vanderbilt or a Rockefeller. And that's just the reality of the issue. Um, these people have created a system that is so unpenetrable that even as a lawyer or as a social justice advocate working within the system trying to fight against the cause or for the cause rather, it's so challenging because what you go, the mindset that you go into it thinking that you can make a change, when you get in it, these people sit you down and give you the reality of what it really is as a pro prosecutor. If you don't bring these numbers in, you're going to be on the unemployment line or you're going to be looking for another career. That's the bottom line. I have had judges come into my office in the sheriff's county crying, stressed out, saying to me things like, I was called in by the chief judge and the chief judge was going over my evaluation and he said to me, you have the highest level of acquittals what, what's the problem? Right. And he looked at the chief judge and he said, the problem is if they're innocent, I got to let them go. The chief judge told him, this is a real judge in Atlanta that sat down and talked. The chief judge told him, nobody is innocent. The reason why nobody is innocent is because this is not about innocence or guilt. Right, it's right. about money. That's exactly. the bottom line. Oh, yeah. The chief judge has an obligation to the county commissioners, the tax commissioners. You got to generate the revenue for the county. That's you the bottom it. line. And the prosecutors held accountable to the county commissioners also. You got to perform as a prosecutor, otherwise you're going to be out of a job. And they play this whole game amongst themselves as a fraternity, the public defender, the private attorneys, the prosecutors, and the judges, all of them. They're all in the same fraternity. So there's no justice. When you go into a courtroom, you don't expect justice. If you don't have God on your side, oh, yeah. woe unto you. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when you stand up before that judge, he asks you, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty or not guilty doesn't mean the same thing you think it means for you that it means for them. When they ask you, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? They ask you, you ready to pay now or are you ready to pay later? Right, right. And when you say not right. guilty, they lock you up, they keep you in jail. You can't, get, you can't get bailed out, they know this. And they come to you a year or two late and they say, you ready to take this deal? And you wanna get out of jail because you're frustrated even though you know you're innocent. And they're gonna say, look man, we're gonna give you time, sir, if you take this little cop out plea, we're gonna put you on some supervised uh, 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 parole or probation where you gotta pay more money so they can make some more money after they release you. 
But you want to get out of jail. So you say, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take the deal. You just said, you know what? I'm ready to pay now. In order for you to take that deal, you got to go stand before the judge and say guilty. Yeah. Let me so, tell you what the problem is. Chief. The problem. <laughs> no, let me just finish up here. Okay, go ahead. The problem is your prosecutors. Your problem is your court clerks. And your problem is the judges. These are the people that you got to hold accountable okay. for all this mess that's going on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And an excellent segue. Um, so my next question is, and I'm going to start with um, Alicia here. What other broken systems do you see contribute to this pipeline to prison? Yeah, so another thing, too, is the, um, when you look at the police force, um, before it even gets to the court level, um, you know, you have the uh, police officers who will either get dispatched to a call or they will um, uh, have contact with somebody, they write a report, they submit it to the prosecutor's office for a charge. Um, and just some of the things that I saw in policing were um, to talk about the implicit and uh, explicit bias, not only in the police force, but also the people that are calling 911. So I got dispatched a few times to like neighborhoods just for a kid that was standing at the bus stop. And it was, oh, this kid's suspicious. Why is he in my neighborhood? He's got a backpack. Um, he might be stealing out of cars. And it, it's kind of this um, implicit bias that creates this uh, issue with, I mean, now for me, you know, I just drove by. I'm like, this is not a police issue. Another cop, they would have maybe stopped the kid, ID'd him, um, and it would have been a huge thing. And those little tiny things can turn into disorderly conduct or, or a, a aggression or a fight. And it's just really dangerous um, for the community and for um, everyone as a whole. And so at the, the police level, I'll say that that is a huge issue. Also with like traffic um, and you know, you have uh, black Hispanic people are more likely to get pulled over by the police and issued a traffic ticket, which if they don't pay their traffic tickets, they can then get a warrant for their arrest. Um, and that still happens in um, Washington County, which is a huge issue. And you look at also the um, how many police are in the different neighborhoods and the rural white communities. I mean, they might have one or two cops working versus you know more urban city areas where people are have a higher likelihood of getting pulled over and ticketed, and they also have the least money if you know to pay the tickets. And so the fact that you can get locked up or go to jail because you can't afford a ticket is that in and of itself is crazy. Okay. And so I'm going to go a little bit off script, and I'm going to ask this. So do we feel that when we're looking at prison being equivalent to slavery, right, New Jim Crow level, right, do we find that quotas are being met on the backs of African-American people? Hmm. And this is for whomever. Yes. <laughs> I'll be whomever. Um, One of the, when I walk in in the morning into the prison, you have your living quarters, your child hall, medical facility, school building, administrative building. Ironically, if you've, those who've ever been to Oakwood College, the dorms are, it's weird how it's, it's set up just like a university. I actually, call, I call it the HBCU that never was. Wow. Because when I walk in there, wow. it's a lot of African American men who are very talented. Yeah. Who are very skilled, like brother. They have talents and abilities that mm. will never be seen or heard of ever again, except amongst themselves. Yeah. So, many of them are the ones that are in uh, MSI, which is the, the plant where they make a lot of things. We, they make soap and some other things, furniture. And again, it's all of this has to do with money. The furniture, if the state wants to use furniture, they cannot always just go out and just go to Ikea or wherever and just grab furniture. They have to get it through MSI. There's a money-making process that, which allows them to work, but it also like, lends to what you just said. It becomes a form of slavery. Where my guys work at, in this institution, they make 17 to 27 cents a day. It's not even an hour, it's a day. So they'll work eight hours and get 27 cents wow. for that day. And so when you see some of this, now I know they were gonna shut it down because it, 
I think my, I have great ideas, and they don't like all of my ideas. And I, one of my ideas is that I don't see a problem with paying them more, not that they would get it while they're incarcerated, but many of them have restitution, meaning they have to pay something back to somebody that they've hurt. Right. So while they're in there working, because they work, a lot of these guys work hard all day. They're, they're the ones that maintain the grass, the, elec the, the yeah. electricians, they're the plumbers. They are in there doing it all. They should be paid up or credited a better wage yeah. that it, even if it was just baked and went to their restitution books. because if I work this hard and then I get out and I still owe and I have no way of paying this back because I don't have a job I'm coming back you got it. so yeah. and then it starts the whole cycle again you get to enslave me even longer you got it yeah. all right so. Yeah, try going to college too and just having debt in itself. Oh, yes, yeah, please yeah. say that. Please say that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, just to kind of like add on to that, you have a lot of kids within the system that uh, go into it and they have a lot of innate potential. They are brilliant to a certain extent, but they just make one stupid mistake at one moment in their life when they're the most vulnerable. And yeah. uh, as uh, my colleague Eli will eventually uh, elaborate, these kids are teenagers and they're hot wired for uh, social connection. So mm -hmm. they're gonna gravitate to whatever group they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the one thing you also have to take in consideration is the fact that um, some of these communities are food deserts and prosperity deserts you where you have people are not able to get access to quality jobs where they can get social mobility. They often are put between rock and a hard place so they often resort to other tactics that are outside the law and they often um, go into unsafe reactions like the drug trade or other um, outlets that they can get in order to make money in order to feed their family or feed their kids. And that's a circumstance that is systemic in of itself because it builds from that context that came from slavery. And that's the thing that we have to really start to un unwind because this issue, as much as many people don't want to acknowledge it, it is intrinsic to America of itself, and yeah. it's one of the things that we have to really kind of work out of, but yeah. Mm. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Let me say something real quick. I, I think, um, and you hit the point also, economically, we are the most vulnerable people yeah. um, in the country, and that comes not just um, per se an individual, but I mean, when we talk about arrests, we are looking in the um, economically deprived areas in the country. So if, if police has to focus their attention somewhere, it's usually what we would call in the black neighborhoods or the black areas, those areas where people are suffering the most and make the most arrests, the most incarcerations occur, the most um, where you see most people call themselves being harassed or targeted, if you will, yeah. you see those areas being the focus of yeah. the um, attention for for the trouble in, in society. Yeah. So I, I think with that focus, it's just like if you look anywhere for something wrong, you'll find it. Yeah. And if you're looking in those areas, you're going to find something wrong. So we being there, regardless of how well you behave or whatever you do, if the attention is there to incarcerate or arrest or whatever, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, I don't have the answer to it at this point, but I'm, I'm sure uh, keep my ears tuned because I would love to hear an answer as to how there could be a change to what's happening to we as a people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeff Cox, did you have something you wanted to add? Or? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Question, somebody. Okay, you want to do the question? Let them Shoot the question real quick. Okay. They said shoot the question real quick. <laughs> so after listening to all of this from the uh, panel um, and knowing how the system is set up, I know this may be a sen sensitive spot for some of us as minorities, as parents, and as church members, we then have an obligation to teach our young people yes to always take defensive action. By that I mean, if you're pulled over by a police officer, drop the attitude. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be arrested. It just reduces the likelihood of that. 
I was in, on Washington Avenue on Friday, went in to grab something to eat, and there were two white police officers. And I went up to the cash register, and I said, I'd like to buy, uh, pay for those two, two guys' lunch. And I, w I went up to them and told them, I just paid for your lunch. And they were like terrified. I'm like, yeah, I just paid for your lunch, it's okay. So we also have a responsibility to engage in random acts of kindness. We need to teach our young man, if you're driving in a neighborhood, you don't need to have your music blaring, you don't need to speed, you don't need to be stupid, you don't need to be a fool. We need to take responsibility for some of the things that we do. Some additional just tips. If a police officer shows up at your house and says, I want you to come down to the uh, precinct because I have some, some questions for you. You don't have to go. Officer shows up at, at your door and says, can I come in? I want to talk to you. <laughs> you do not have to open your door, not unless there's a search warrant. So those are things that we need to be aware of. I just wanted to make those um, comments. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, I'm kind of surprised no one on the panel addressed the media. The media <laughs> is, I wouldn't say it's the number one factor, but if you check, even in the church, I'm looking at some of the young people, although we said they shouldn't be on their phones, check and see what they're playing. They are playing some video games that's gearing them up to go get a weapon. The games that they play is gearing them up to be in prison. I want you all to check it out. Check the games out your kids play and you think it's, people think it's a joke. Mm. So that's one. Number two is we ourselves are also a big factor. Now for the 19 years I was working on Rikers Island, I normally talk to most of the young people because like I said, it's a open and close door. They go out, next six months they back okay. in. What's going on, brother? Uh, man, you know the same old story. No, it's not the same old story. It's, it's a new one. The families are there, the Caucasian family, as we are saying, they're in a better position, yes. Most of the lawyers are Caucasian or Jew. We don't have that many black lawyers, DAs, but the DAs and the lawyers and the judge are working together, so you know that. So don't think that when you go there, oh, I paying the attorney so much money. Yeah, okay. They all got to sit down and figure out what's going on. But the bottom line is this. If a kid get locked up, most of the time when they do get out, what do we say? I tell you, he's like this or she's like that, and that's all we keep saying. Are we saying, you know what? Nah. Let me get you a program. Up. No, he was locked up. You're like your father, like your uncle. No, go out of there. No, if you get locked up, I ain't coming to see you. So you know what? So when they do come out, we might show them love for a little week. But then all of a sudden, we fall off the, the chart and we go back and say, no, you better go back in jail because you're up to do the same old good. So, and society, when these guys get out and they try to get a job, the first thing they do is they say, uh, once they find out you was locked up, they say, oops. The red flag goes up because a lot of us don't own any business, so they got to go to the same Caucasian people that in jail, they keep telling you, oh, you working for the cracker. I said, brother, man, the cracker paying me, but check this out. You, what do you think you're doing? You working for the cracker right now. So I'm just, <laughs> let, me, let me just, don't, but that's, I'm, let's keep it real, right? Mm -hmm. You working for these folks because you know what? You going out there and you spreading drugs, yeah. Trying to feed your family because the young mothers out there, the fathers, most of the fathers are locked up. Now, sometimes I'm in jail and there's a father, son, his brother, uncle, and everybody locked up, and his mother's in another jail, right? So the young people, when they do get out, they become fathers before them time, that's number one. Because a lot of times, I'm gonna tell you all right now, don't be naive about your kids. I'm not naive about mine, okay? When you are there doing two and three jobs, your kids is doing something else. When you send them to school, before they get to the school, they don't change off into something else. They got a different twang. 
They leave. Oh yes, mom, I'm going to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good day, good day, sir. How you doing? Before they get, when they get in school, is ba 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 ba. As soon as they get out of school, so by the time they get to your house, it's straight up and down. And you say, oh yeah, my son is this. Nah, you better check yourself. Take a time out from your work and go check your kids out for that school day without them knowing, and then you'll find out. 85% of them is doing things you will never, never assume because you assume that they're not doing it. From smoking to cursing to, to robbing people to doing everything. So you better check yourself, people. Check your kids out. Check them out. But let's start helping the young people. When they do get out of the jail, let's get some program. Let's adopt them. Let's, let's like people say, help them out. Tell them, now. Nah, you know what? I got your back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you, put you in a job, put you in, get you a job. Some other, I'm going to help you. But I don't want you going back in there. If we start doing that, half of the young people won't go in there again because they're going to start telling the other young people. And they're going to look at the other one and say, oh, he just came out of jail, but my man is working. Where he working at? I need to know. Let me go check him out. What is he doing? But if they see after two weeks, they already know what time it is. He's in jail or he's doing the same thing. Then that's what they're going to do. Because you know what? We don't have enough money or we don't give them the resources. Oh, yeah, we, we send our kids. Even the ones that's quote unquote, right, on a different level, they got to check themselves out. Because you know what? They get trapped off also when they do come out to the environment. That's why a lot of people in church right now, yeah, you bring them up in church, but then when they go to school, like I say, it's a different environment. When they get to college, it's a different environment. And the temptation is great. And if you can't, <laughs> it's, it's nipping at you. And it's going to keep nipping and you're going to get caught up in the system so fast you wouldn't even know. Your head be spinning. Trust me. All right. And I so love much. that. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to kind of try to move this along and stay on, you know, track with the line of questioning. Um, and so since, uh, Chaplain Cox, you have this, what are the traps that you've identified once a person of color has had one involvement with the police or the judicial system? What is at least one trap you have identified that helps to keep them tethered there? I wanted to... Um first address the issue of, uh, I'm going to just go back to the issue of quotas. Um, I believe that as professional people working within the system that we need to hold ourselves accountable first by, by adjusting the way that we think about the system before we can even make changes within the system. That's number one. Um, it is a myth to believe that policing and uh, prosecuting is not about quotas. It's a myth. It is about quotas. Kamala Harris would not have been the uh, Attorney General had she not stacked numbers as a district attorney. You don't get to go from one level to the next without performing. You gotta perform. You don't get to go from a corporal to a sergeant to a lieutenant, to a captain, without performance. If I had my way, I would seriously, <laughs> I would seriously put every police officer behind bars. Seriously. It's, it's not a joke. Here's, here's why I'm saying that. As a law enforcement officer, when you graduate at the academy, you raise your right hand and you say, I swore an oath to uphold and defend the United States Constitution of, uh, uh, from all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's your oath of office. When you get in that patrol car and you start patrolling the streets, it, it all turns around and it becomes code enforcement. It becomes ticketing for money. It becomes pulling people over, which has nothing to do with crimes of harm, injury, or loss. It's all for money. It's all code enforcement. Your loyalty as a police officer becomes an issue where you become loyal to the corporations, to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, and all the other corporations around that's paying your salary. It's not, you're not being held accountable to the people that you're supposed to represent and protect, serve and protect. Every police officer should be arrested and thrown in prison for exceeding their authority, for dishonest service to the public, they should be thrown in prison. Or violation of the oath of office. Except, except, the force. except no. the retired police officer who's sitting on the panel. 
I know. And so, all right, so let's get back to the question here. What <laughs> traps have you identified so we can kind of move it along? Um, once they're involved in the system or have had contact with the police, have had to interface before a judge, where do we find the traps for persons of color when they've had their initial contact? I've been in, in the, uh, I've been in the, uh, the office in the sheriff's office, in, in, in my office, and I've heard sheriffs outside the office having their little powwow talks, you know, high-fiving about this arrest that they made. Uh, I've even heard them talking about, you know, this guy that I stopped, you know, he was boasting that he had a clean record, but it didn't sell no more. And so the whole point is to give every minority a record because they know that once they do that, that's where it takes off. Right. Because the, the system looks at your history, your background, and they base everything moving forward off of that background. And so that's where the first trap is. And once you get into the system, once you get locked up and you had to go through legal process, it's hard to get out of that situation. Unless, like uh, uh, Mr. Prosecutor said, you got money. You're related to somebody that got money. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in there. People are in jail for uh, uh, misdemeanor crimes, charges, frivolous charges that the police like to put in number one charges, terroristic threats. You can't even exercise your, your, your uh, freedom of speech anymore. Police are charge you with terroristic threats just to get you in cuffs. Another charge that they will put on you is uh, uh, criminal trespass. You know, I've seen police officers lock people up for sleeping in abandoned buildings saying that they trespass. How in the world are you gonna trespass somebody for sleeping in an abandoned building that you don't own as a police officer? No. You can't trespass somebody for sleeping in an abandoned building. You don't have title or deed to that property. The most you can do is ask the person to leave. Mm -hmm. Why are you arresting them and charging them with criminal trespass? I had a young man who was charged with criminal trespass in his mother's house because him and his mother had an argument and the neighbor called the police and the police came and the mother innocently opened the door, which she shouldn't have. She opened the door and told him, oh, it's, it's no big deal. And my son and I, we had an argument and he broke my lamp. And they called the son and told him, turn around and handcuffed him. And the mother said, well, why are you arresting my son? You just told us that he broke your lamp. He broke your property. We charged him with criminal trespass. So and I had to go to like court, I had to go to court and advocate for that young man, sat with the prosecutor who was trying to move this case forward to give this kid a record for criminal trespass while the mother is sitting in court saying that she doesn't want to press charges. And it wasn't a big deal. We just had an argument. Yeah, I hear that a lot with the kids in which I work with as well, right? Domestic violence within the home, if you get into an argument or a fight or if the parent feels that they can't control their children and they need, right, some sort of backup, there we go. Just that to prove a point, just to prove a point, yes. that case was dismissed. The reason why it was dismissed, you can't charge somebody with yeah. criminal trespass in their own house. Right, right. Especially when the mother doesn't want it. Who, which prosecutor right, in their right, right mind would take that? But here's the trap, because we don't educate our young people about, you know, the rules of criminal and civil procedures, and we don't even educate ourselves. We don't know the system. We don't understand the system. That young man, if I wasn't there, they would have took a plea deal, and he would have incriminated himself and locked himself and given himself a record, and the prosecutor would have allowed him to do that. That's the problem. The prosecutors, the lawyers, and the judges. Yeah. That's where the trap is. Right, I agree. We can go and talk about when they get out, the traps when they get out. All right. All right, next. So just like an overarching point when it comes down to the media, just to go back to this, I think this is a very important point, is just like how people of color in general, especially African Americans, are portrayed within the media to a certain extent. We are um, often perceived as being thugs, and you have a lot of folks that usually just kind of resort to always seeing, and this kind of relates back to the implicit bias point that you mentioned before, just like there's always that philosophy into thinking that there is in some shape or form African Americans are perceived as being criminals, they're like evil in some aspects. So that's the thing that um, really just like ties into what we're talking about and that's something that's very important in order to understand what kind of context we're working with. and figuring out ways in which we can work out of it of itself. So that's pretty much all I wanted to really say. Is anyone else? Let me just jump in here real quick. Here's, here's where we could work a deal right now, because the prosecutors like to work deals. Here's where we can work a deal. 
with Mr. Prosecutor so right he's here. Not a prosecutor. I'm not a prosecutor. No, 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 no. I'm not saying, I'm saying no, hold on, 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 hold on. I'm speaking prophetically. I know he's, I know he's not a prosecutor yet, but he's sitting here. Yeah. At least he's giving us an ear and he's willing to work with us. So he's sitting yeah. here. Yeah. And he's looking at possible election into that position. Yeah. And so here's where we can strike a deal. Now, we know that a lot of our children, a lot of our kids out there really committing serious crimes. Oh, yeah. And they're committing misdemeanor crimes as well. What we're saying to Mr. Prosecutor is that when one of our kids come before you, and it's a situation where we know that they're in fact guilty and we don't want to move forward because they can, if they go to trial and they blow trial, they end up getting a whole lot of time, get them the best deal possible. Don't railroad them in terms of the deal that you're going to give them. All right, the ones that, that are not guilty, let them go. Be man enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to stack numbers off of this person. Let them go. <laughs> say this person is innocent. We don't have enough evidence to move forward. Let them go. All right. Deal. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Deal. Deal. You heard, you, you heard me say it here. And, 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 and let, me, let, me, let me say this with respect to, to plea bargaining. Because yeah. you are absolutely right. You know, we think about the criminal justice system, uh, a lot of people do, like we see on TV, right? You know, there's a, there's a trial and there's a jury that, that renders the verdict. 97% of the cases in this country are disposed of via plea bargain. And that is a driver of wrongful convictions. It's a driver of inequitable sentences. Because what prosecutors do is they have all the power in the world. And they've got somebody sitting across from them. And what they'll threaten is something that they can't possibly prove up at trial, like trespassing in your own home, right? Or an aggravator there. You know, maybe they'll say, look, you know, plead guilty to this. Or in addition to trespassing in your own home, I'm going to charge you with like malicious destruction of property that was yours to begin with, too. And that's going to be even more time. So I made it actually a centerpiece of my campaign to say we are not engaging in coercive plea bargaining. Come on. We are going to engage in fair plea bargaining. We're not threatening anything we can't prove up beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. We're not going to seek to hold people on cash bail so that implicit coercion is there too because oftentimes if you're sitting in jail, you're just going to say, yes, I'm guilty, just so you can yeah. get out and get back to your job and get back to your family. If you remove that coercion, we're going to get a lot uh, fairer deals because I think the worst thing a prosecutor can do, frankly, is convict an innocent person or send somebody to prison or to jail for, for one day longer than is necessary to protect the safety of society. All right, Ladies so and gentlemen, I'm the next gonna... prosecutor, Ypsilanti. <laughs> <laughs> so Eli, I, I would just kind of ask, can you kind of, again, for our youth, share what plea bargaining really is and the like impact of that? Yeah, sorry, I, 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 get, I get worked up and then I forget that not everybody here is a lawyer. <laughs> uh, so so what, what happens is y you can get arrested and the prosecutor will file the initial charges, right? And, and that can carry with it um, potential consequences ranging from probation to, you know, depending on the, on the crime, prison. But typically before a case goes to trial, and you have a constitutional right to a trial by jury, but before a case goes to trial, the prosecutor will sit down with the defendant and the defendant's lawyers, and they'll say, look, here's our deal. We don't want to go to trial because it costs a lot of money. Uh, it's, it, it's really expensive, and you probably don't want it either. So we're going to give you a deal. Rather than going to trial where you might face, say, 10 years in, in, in prison, we'll offer you two years and, and three years of probation if you just plead guilty right now, and then we'll go in front of the judge, and the judge will rubber stamp it, and you won't get a trial, that will be all that happens to you. And that's how 97% of the cases in this country are disposed because, you know, oftentimes people are, people are desperate. And, you know, if they're being held in jail, if they're being held in jail, they're, they're, they're going to plead guilty. Um, right. So, um, so, so that's, that, that's basically what plea bargaining is. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I have one question here, and then I want to come back to the panel. I would like for Keith and Tony to share what traps that you all have seen within right, the jails that continue the recidivism that we see, um, as well as Dyer kind of share right, from the police perspective. Pastor. Well, I really don't have a question, just uh, a comment. Most of us may not remember Cassandra Bland this is a young lady who was pulled over for not signaling 
at a lane change. And allegedly, she hung herself in prison. She should not have been pulled over at all. So it begins with the police. And then the police was seen on video telling her to you know, stop smoking. And when she said, I'm in my car, he said, I light you up. That policeman was allowed to, he lost his job, that's it for him. But I think in terms of a solution is the way crime statistics are reported. The UCR, I think if, I don't know if they use it in Washington or but the UCR is Uniform Crime Reporting System. What they do, if they come and they see a group of kids standing at a corner, they're not arrested, they might be detained. Those kids, are, the names are entered into a system. The numbers, that the people that they stop, those numbers are used to put more police officers in that area. And someone alluded to it earlier, if you put more police officers concentrated in an area, you'll arrest more people. And we, when we think of disparities, look and see where policing is done in areas of minorities versus the dominant population. So I think a solution could be if we could just change the way in which we determine where police goes. And the last thing I will say, as a person of color, I don't know if you can see, I'm a person of color. <laughs> and one of the things you said, and I hope that you can, I, I think you meant well by saying it, where you sit down, sometimes the public defender is so occupied with so many cases that there is meet and plead that is in the hallway. They don't sit down with anybody. They're in the their the, the court, they're meeting the person for the first time in the hallway before the courtroom. So one of the things I think that I, I can ask you for is to ensure that when people are arrested, that the quota-driven system, you can say, I'm only one person, but Dr. King was only one person. And great change can come with one person. And I think it's really dishonest when police officers say, officers, I have a brother who's a 28-year-old veteran NYPD, and he will never tell me to this day he has quarters. That's my blood brother. But they do have quarters. And they, they give you all the reasons why they have to stop. And, but the reality is they're sent out there to make money off of the backs of poor people who happen to be black people. All right, so Keith, if you all can continue with that question, and then I'll Go out to the audience here. So traps that you see that continues this recidivism. And recidivism means returning, like that, that will. Yeah. Okay, one more minute. Okay, while, while, Keith is, while Keith is warming up. <laughs> I, 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 again, I think the biggest factor is economics. And that goes on both sides, for those who don't have and those who have too much. For the money-hungry people who are thriving off of the prison industrial system um, and wanting to see the quotas met and people constantly incarcerated to those who don't have from the time that they are born, and I've kind of alluded to that from the very beginning, economics affects how parents raise their children and when they are lacking and when they don't have, they do what they need to do to get the monies to raise their kids. And sometimes that means you have to go to the state, you have to play these games in order to get that check uh, to the degree to where you keep your kid in that system and they become so accustomed to that system that they grow in that system. Yeah. So introduce recidivism back and forth. It becomes your way of life. So what I'm hearing is, is you're saying that as humans, mm -hmm. right, if we're in an environment long enough, then that's all we know and that's where we grow and that's where we do things. True, true. And, and even though I'm, I think education may be a factor that may help get us out of that system, but we have even, I've heard it alluded to here on the panel. 
that just because you know something, and even in the audience, you cannot always express yourself to the strongest of ways. I mean, you may be educated and you feel you have a, a strong stance that I'm not guilty, you can't arrest me, you can't come in my house, you can't do whatever. So when you try to express yourself with some strength, some reason or another, it's going to get turned around and you're going to get arrested again. You know, so it's like a catch-22. You get educated, you find your rights, you do all those things that you know you can do for yourself, and they still work against you. And then when you are dumbfounded and you're sitting in before a prosecutor or whatever and they come at you with all this terminology and all these charges thrown at you and you're already scared. So you, just like they say, you say, okay, just let me go home. Yeah. Yeah, just to kind of add on to that in of itself, the fact that people have to literally do two to three jobs in order to make ends meet within this current economic system to a certain extent. And uh, you have individuals that uh, just don't have time to actually, let alone, like, you know, tend to other things that might have to do with, like, family life or any other action that they would do on their leisure. They, they don't have enough money to actually, like, I don't even know how to really say it. They don't have enough um, of an ability to actually pay attention to politics, and this race especially. And that's the thing that just kind of like preoccupies people's lives because they have to make ends meet, and they just like have these barriers to actually like making a successful living, like social mobility in itself. And you just have a downward spiral where people are constantly being put into a system where they might have to resort to breaking the law in order to make money. So that's pretty much all I can re really say to that. So. OK, real quick. I will, economics, absolutely. Uh, but when we look at, uh, when I look at recidivism, I look at a lot. Because I also see it from the medical, uh, the medical side. Again, I deal with a lot of the guys who are mentally ill, physically ill. And just in that, I have guys who've gotten out and come back just for medical treatment. Um, if I'm actually, no, not if, there's a guy I'm thinking about right now who has been diagnosed with cancer outside, in, as they call it, in the world, the, the chemo medicine is $250,000 for one or two pills. <laughs> On his own, he can't pay that, True. but when he comes back, it's covered. It's covered. If he, if, I don't care what happens, it's covered. So I, I see some guys come back because, again, the system is broken. I can't live out here, so I'm going to go back. My homeless population, some of these guys, my favorite guys, because they have it time to a T, starting to get cold. I, I need to check in for about 90 days. So that's where you may see some guys squat at an abandoned house because they have it broken down to a science. I'll get thrown in. I'll stay for the winter. I'm coming back. So when they see me, Jones, I'm back. It's clockwork. I knew he was coming. So I, I see some guys, I see recidivism for that because we have a homeless system that's also broken. Um, but so everyone isn't coming back for criminal reasons or criminality. It's, it's all kind of reasons. But for those who do come back for breaking the law, it's again, we have a system and I do include us in this failure. It's post release is terrible. These guys get out, and I understand. When I, when I talk to them again, what happened? And they start going, again, I set up services. I get them their health care. I find, I find work for them. I find jobs for them. And sometimes they fail themselves. I have some relapse, and they, they come back. But even for relapse and drugs, I've seen some go to treatment where others will be sent to prison. So even. There's, a, in, there's definitely some imbalance in that. Well, not some, there's lots of imbalance in who gets treatment and who goes back to prison. There's so much as to why guys come back and what happens to them. And again, relapsing from substance abuse should not give you another five, 10 years in prison. It's not gonna fix the problem. It's not, it doesn't. But they come back, they get stuck, and when they get out, because they become so institutional, institutionalized, living out in the world, that's why I'm, I'm impressed with Brother Lewis already, because it's, hard to be in there for all this time and then come out is literally going to another planet. Mm -hmm. it, it, you've, I have a guy who told me, I've never held a cell phone. I've never been in a car. 
Well, in a car where, you know, the navigation is telling you where to go. Because he was asking me, what is that like to have a, you know, but these guys have been in there so long that this is their life. So many of them, when they get out, they're, they're scared before they even leave. So fear of adapting, not being able to take care of themselves. They've burned all bridges with family. And so prison will always take them. So why not come back? Yeah, um, just some traps that I was thinking about. Um, someone had mentioned pretext stops or like stopping someone for taillight out or headlight out. Um, so the fact that that traffic stop, A, can turn into a car search and a number of other things. Um, but you can also get a ticket for having a headlight out. If you can't pay that um, and you, you know, don't show up to court, you then can get your license suspended. Um, then when your license is suspended, you can actually be arrested. It's a misdemeanor. Then your car can get impounded. And it, it's this big, just systemic trickle-down violence that is um, cost. Well, in Michigan, I mean, this is, I think, we're the worst state in the U.S. for um, the driving while license suspended and insurance charges. But the fact that people are being jailed for this so they don't have the money to get out. So I remember I pulled over a parent one time, and she had 10 traffic warrants, all equating, I mean, it must have been about over eight grand. And I mean, at that point, I mean, she's like, I got to go to work every day. I'm never going to be able to pay it. And it was kind of, you know, hope and pray that you don't get arrested and go to jail and the cop lets you go. And that's, I mean, that in and of itself is violence. Like, I feel like that is a crime. And, and so I think that these little traps, like all of this can start just from a headlight out and your neighborhood's over policed and uh, maybe you got a few tickets you couldn't pay. And then it just keeps going. And those little things like that. The other thing is probation. Um, when people are on probation and they can't afford to drop or can't afford to the requirements for probation and you, they might take a plea deal because they're coerced or for whatever reason and then they can't get off of probation and they're constantly violating probation. A lot of the kids I worked with, I mean, a lot of them would get in trouble for violating probation over and over again and it was just this constant revolving circle. Um, and where I feel like being on probation is a trap of, in and of itself. Um, for some people, if you don't have money to pay for something, you're going to violate. So, yeah. We have a question here, here, and then one here. I'm thinking about a trap that outweighs any trap that I can think about. It starts before you get to 18. I lived in a beautiful community once, and I went back to visit and I saw a magnificent building. Couldn't even believe it was in that town where I lived. Beautiful and huge. Took up a lot of square footage for that building. And when I found out about the building, I learned that all of the black schools in the northeast area of the town housed in that new building. And in the heart of the building was a police station. It is still there because it's new, it started about maybe two years ago. That's a new concept of trapping our children. And I wonder if, if anybody is going to copy in these United States that system. The people fought, but they were not strong enough for those against them, for bringing all of, I think it was four black schools into one building, all of the high schools housed there, and a police station in the building. Mm. They don't have to go anywhere to arrest them anymore. They just have to talk loud in the hall. And I'm wondering if, I, don't, I haven't heard of it, but is there somebody, well, would, you may not even be concerned, but you could pay attention to Huntsville, Alabama. In the heart of the school is the police station. They don't even have to drive their cars to arrest them anymore. It's, it's the same thing in Benton Harbor, Michigan, actually. They've got, they've got a police station right, right in the school, yeah. Um, my, uh, this is more of an observation slash question. Um, Chaplain Cox, you gave a lot of stats this morning and this afternoon, and a lot of your stats went back to everything being about money and then you also gave stats um, concerning how many 
minorities or blacks are in the United States versus whites. And if this is about money, this conversation is really confusing me because we don't have the money. But yeah, but if it's about money and it's about bail and who can afford bail and how many people there are versus us, we have the least amount of people and the least amount of money. So it still doesn't make sense. To me, it's about hate and race, really, when it all boils down to it. It can't just be about money, because we don't have it and we don't have the numbers. All right, so we're looking at the privatization of the uh, prison system. So one person, take that one, just one, and then I'm coming over here. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm I'm go with you on this one. Um, and we say it's about, it's, it's commercial, it's being commercialized. We're talking about, it costs at least anywhere between forty-five to hundred thousand dollars depending on which state you're in and what level of crime and uh, if you're at the federal level or the state level jail to house an inmate. And even the jail that I'm at, it always has to be at least 80% uh, uh, filled occupancy because they get subsidies from the federal government to house these inmates, so it's about money. <laughs> So if this jail drops below 80% uh, uh, population, they start losing the monies that is there allotted for them to receive the house inmates. So they gotta go out there again, stack numbers, and bring bodies in. But if right. there's more of other people that don't look like us, why are we the one, why are we so, so here- Every, every, okay. it's, it's hard to understand it. It goes into a lot more details and debt, and it would take forever to be able to explain this, but when you talk about bonding and all this, all these cases are monetized. They don't tell you this. Every single docket number is attached to uh, some type of banking system and is being traded on Wall Street. So there's a lot of deep stuff that goes into all this uh, uh, policing and, and, and you know within the system. And that's why it becomes commercial from that perspective. It's not about what you think it is, you know, that as a black person, you don't have the ability to pay. They want your body. That's where the money is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically everything. But that's basically, <laughs> that's almost everything. But let's, let, let's kind of look at it and just kind of keep it at a simple, right, level. Yeah. Yeah. Eli, if you could kind of just try to simplify that. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so one other thing is there's a lot of private industries yeah. which profit off of our prison system. That's right. And one of those is, a major one, is the cash bail industry. And, and this plays into poverty, right? Because if you are held in jail on cash bail and you don't have the money, right. one thing you can do is go to a bail bondsman exactly. who's going to charge you a 10% interest and all these penalties right. if you get late. That's something that the guy in Connecticut that I mentioned that has $6 million sitting around, he doesn't have to go to. So they're profiting not just by keeping uh, people in, in this unjust system where we have cash bail. They're profiting precisely because it's a system in which people don't have money. That's the only reason that you would go to a bail bondsman in the first place. Then you have these other uh, uh, private companies that profiteer off the, off the prison system. If you're out on an ankle monitor, right, you pay yeah. directly to the company $10 a day, which I've never been able to figure yeah. out because I have a GPS right here and it can do a lot more stuff Right? And it doesn't cost me $10 a day, right? So they're making right. huge profit margins. The prison phone system, phone they're charging, they're charging $25 huge amounts of money to, to build connections with their family. And, and the, one, one key point is this, who do you think is funding politicians' campaigns, right? Yeah. And so there's a huge resistance to change because in a lot of places, the bail bond industry is a major contributor to politicians' campaigns, not mine. Uh, yeah. you, you might be able to tell, they, they're not too fond of me. Uh, and as, as well as all of these other industries that just profit here, not just from keeping people locked up, but from keeping poor people locked up. And so to add to that, Leisha, right, so you're hearing the financial part of it, but we cannot excuse that there is a racial portion about That's this, right. right? That deals with the hatred of black and brown people in America. That is real. So if that is kind of... It's not about the money of what you own per se, exactly. but as they're it's saying, they have to utilize bodies to be able to get it. So for instance, 
when and Keith and I, we were walk, working at a juvenile justice level system, um, high secure system, right. like and simply if you were out of that particular county and they sent one of the youth there, for one year, one child, $330,000 is what they would get, one child. And so on my pod alone, I had a maximum of anywhere between 10 to 15, do the math. That was one pod, yeah. right? And we had multiple in this building. So it is a financial piece, but the part of it, when you're looking at the racial inequities, it comes in, right, from the hatred that's present of, of black and brown people. Okay, we have a question here. And then Doug had a question. Okay, a comment, go ahead. Quickly, I worked for 20 years also in the prison system. I retired as an assistant deputy warden in 2007 after doing 20 years. And we would, I was just hearing about the traps, and there's so many, like the sweeps. I just want to add to that quickly. Sweeps. So a sweep is when they target a, a particular location, and then they just go in and arrest everyone. So you could have been minding your business, whatever, everyone is going to jail and you have to find a way to get out. And of course, the sweeps are done mostly in our neighborhoods, right? <laughs> then when we go to prison and we got arrested, the police officer that arrested us, you swear that that person is going to jail. Somehow they got out early. Once um, that, those individuals know that prisoner is out, unfortunately, we go back to the same neighborhoods, right? We don't have a job. It's, it's the part, we, we call it, I um, mean, well, Chaplain Cox's, all police officers should be arrested. And I'm in corrections, I said we're the Department of Corruption. So, <laughs> yes, the, the ones who kept um, asked to watch them and keep them safe. But, you know, so this inmate came out, any crime he commits, okay, anything that happens in that vicinity where he got arrested before, th those people who arrested him before, they go and look for him. And yes, they may be doing some things, and so of course what happens, we end up, um, they say, well, you know what, I see you, I, we got you on camera. Whether we got them on camera doing this and doing that, so then they cop out, they're back in jail again. They're not coming out, you know? And then, of course, it's a quarter thing also, another trap. So I have a very, very, very close friend that's a police sergeant, and he said he feels so guilty because they're giving orders to target parks. People are just playing basketball. And he was saying he couldn't wait to retire because they were given quotas to arrest any, if you just find one person smoking, just arrest everyone. And this one kid was just crying because he was just killing time, um, waiting to go to night school. And explaining that, but everyone got arrested. Wow. And again, once your fingerprint is on record, no one is, even us, us of color, we have a business. The first, one of the questions is asked, have you ever been arrested? We don't want to know why, we, very few of us will do research. Once you say yes, we don't want to hear anything. You know, so it's a lot, and it can go on and on and on. <laughs> Thank you for adding to the That's conversation. Crazy. Doug? Huh, no? Okay. Okay, so we have one here, and then we're gonna First of all, I want to thank Leah and the panel for doing this. This is something that is very much needed, especially here in Washington County. I see that the panel that we have here is from other states as well as Washington County. And I want to say thank you for coming, Lisa, because we've worked together on the south side of Ypsilanti. I want you to know that we are, this church is on the south side of Ypsilanti. And if you look around you, there are four, including Messiah's Temple, of five churches here. How many people in Washington County are aware of the resources that you are talking about here? There are a number of resources in this county to help the people that we are talking about, but it takes networking together, nowhere to turn, and one of the things that I have learned is some people in power can't say what they would like to say. Mm -hmm. 
We used to have a juvenile court, a juvenile division on Platte Road in Ann Arbor. They moved it to Washington County on Washington, Washington Street. And so the young people are in pretty much the same area as adults. And you perhaps have heard me testify in church and say that we have children sleeping on the jail floor because their parents are incarcerated. So it takes us networking with the resources that we have here. Now, most people that I've worked with refer to me as Leah with community mental health, but I know that that's not all that she does. However, that is a big issue in this county. There are funds in this county to work with if you would just get to know where they are. Now, I know some churches don't believe in grant funding. You don't have to use grant funding if you network with an organization that is doing, willing to work with you. At one time, our churches in this community came together. Wherever there was an issue on the south side, S.L. Robeson was there if it was 2 o'clock in the morning. Many of you know the Robeson family. Many of you that are here today do not know, but the churches came together. The problem with the south side of Ypsilanti, and the police department is short-staffed. If you're in Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan is helping with that, help pay that police department. It helps with the transportation. So we as people have to volunteer our time and network with those resources that are out here because we can say what we want to say because we are not on someone's payroll. But you cannot say because you will get fired. And that's what's happening to a lot of our black population. So I just want to say to the panel that you have here and to the resources, it would be nice to know what position. We have a lot of professional people here in this community. We have people in the women's prison and the federal prison that would like to come out but they have been in so long, right here in Washington County, that have been in so long, they have nowhere to go, their family is gone. And we just had a funeral today over at Metropolitan Baptist Church where the young man committed suicide, 34 years of age. And the suicide rate is very high, especially this time of the year. So all I'm saying to you as a follow-up from this day, if we would just look at the resources that we have here in our church network those with them, and volunteer your time. God gave us all a talent. Use the talent that God gave you. Thank you. Thank Amen. You. Okay, you had one, Jeremiah. I'm going to let this be the last one of the audience, and then we're going to wrap it up with one final question. Uh, I'm Jeremiah Richardson. I'm actually a current deputy with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. Uh, what I would say is one of the things I've experienced, I've kind of worked in Ypsilanti schools as a school officer uh, and dealing with the kids, one thing I uh, even telling my daughter is when something happens, make sure you tell your parent right away. A lot of kids are often afraid to speak up and say, hey, I had sex, hey, I did this, and then if you don't tell your kid this, you're having these conversations and you don't tell them right away and they don't tell you right away it makes it harder for a parent to help you so i constantly remind kids and my daughter and my niece to tell me right away if something happens now my daughter had an incident recently where she gave her bank account information to somebody and she hid it from me and now she owes the bank fifteen hundred dollars now i told her this time and time again and then after i found out about it i said did you tell me about this and she said no Oh, well, no, she told me she did. So even though I told her time and time again to tell me when something happens so I can help you, you got to keep having those conversations. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in Detroit. I went to Detroit <laughs> Public Schools. Granted, technically I was born in Southfield. Let me correct that. But I went to Detroit Public Schools. When I grew up, Bloods and Crips were strong in the neighborhood on the west side. I almost went to Cody High School. Did not want to go to Cody High School. I always wanted to be a cop when I was a kid. It was very exciting to me. Now, one thing, working here in primarily Ypsilanti Township, I've gone to scenes where people say, why are you the police? You know, the, the police is a gang. You know, they're pretty much the KKK. 
And what I told somebody is, I said, but wouldn't you want some of us to be the police? You know, some of us, as long as you have the right attitude, you're educated and you're thinking about how you're going to do your job can make a difference. Now, unfortunately, I dealt with a lot of kids when I was in Nipsey School. And I kind of got a reputation to a certain extent because I was kind of serious to a certain degree because I was like, I actually wanted to help the kids. Now, I've been cussed out and all kind of things, but any time a kid would cuss me out, I'd go back and talk to them. Some of them still don't like me. But the thing is, is I actually do care. And to me, I guess I'm kind of the opposition, but I don't think all police are bad, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm big on traffic enforcement. If you see a sheriff car on the highway, it's probably me, okay? Yeah. But I'm looking for somebody going about 15 over, and normally I'm stopping at about 90 miles over and 100 miles over because I believe traffic safety is important because when I help out with traffic crashes and fatal crashes, that's important to me, okay? I'm not just stopping you for something minor. Yeah. If I do, I'm probably gonna let you go. But what I wanna say is, is that we need more of us on the force because it's better. Because when I go out and I work out in other areas of our county and I write tickets because they ain't used to seeing the police out there, oh, I believe in fairness. Because you live out here in Sio and Dexter and stuff like that, oh, you can get tickets too. And when you talk nice and talk proper and stuff like that, that don't mean nothing to me because you're gonna get your ticket. Because as you said, as you said over here, the money, other places. Here's a, here's a reason why I actually get on the 94. Technically, you don't patrol the 94, but I get on the 94. is because I'm getting people who are not in our community. I'm spreading the money around. I'm not just focused on patrolling in West Willow or stuff like that. I want to make sure that it's balanced out. It's even and being fair. So it's kind of my two cents on make sure you're talking to your kids. Make sure you're constantly giving them that reminder. They make the mistake. Tell, have them tell you immediately. That's the only way you can help them sometimes. All right, thank you. And I will add, we need more of us in the school system, yeah. right? The school to prison pipeline is real. I know that I said that Richardson was gonna be the last one. I forgot, I overlooked Terry and I do apologize. So I'm gonna allow him to ask his question. And then I want for the panel to begin to just think about and share out one thing that they feel that the church could do, and then we will wrap this up. Okay. Okay. Uh, my problem started when I hit, what, driving, you driving at 17, 16. I've never been to jail, but I've paid out I'm 54 now. I paid out probably $20,000 to the police. Um, constant, constant, constant. So now I'm trying, I know the judicial system don't work for me. I've heard all this. I did a report at Washington College. I went to Washington, I did a report on it. They looked at me like I was crazy because I put some things in that happened in my life. They couldn't understand it. They didn't know the, whether to clap or to say I'm sorry. You know? So now I'm looking at my son, because he's going to go through, because we're cattle. Okay? They making money off of We cash cows. That's not going to change. How do I protect my son? You know what I'm saying? I got to protect my son. So therefore, I, I, me, I tell them, you got to know, you got to have a plan. Every time you go out, you need to know where you're going. Who you with? Prove that you've been there. You know, Carytown got robbed. I'm doing construction on a building. They came to me, only black guy, rest white guys, and was trying to lock me up. My boss was like, he's here. And that was almost not enough. So I look at my son. He's naive now, but I'm, I'm putting it in him because the system don't work for black males. That's just the way it is. You know, I feuded with Ipsy police. They told me, they killed one of my friends and told me they did it. Why they tell me that? Because I'm next. That's why I end up in Ipsy church. I grew up in Ipsy, stepped out for a little while, but that's what brought me back. Because they like, oh, okay. Well, we can tell you because you're next. You know what I'm saying? So that's, I mean, I tried to teach my son the best I can. 
The laws don't work for us. So therefore, God, and use your common sense. You know, other than that, if they get you, then you're looking at God. God brought me out of that mess. Only God, my prayers. And there would have been no way out of it. You know what I'm saying? So this system is just of the devil. It's meant to be. That's why we got to have God. There is no other way out. So do we have a word, one person just on, how can we help to equip a young black, and can't just say our young black men, but People. our young black People. men and women, like just People. one thought, and I'll come to Alicia, simply because she was on the front lines of it, kind of like that start. What would be your advice? Uh, so I would say, um, obviously doing everything you, can to avoid um, getting into any kind of issue in a car because I feel like mm -hmm. with driving a car um, that's a lot of the uh, kids that I mentored like one of their uh, first thing they got in trouble for had to do with some kind of vehicle infraction some kind mm -hmm. of rolling a stop sign or driving in um, in Ipsy there was like a fad going around where kids were taking cars and driving them around uh, like stolen cars and um, just be you know being kids but I mean the um, just being in a car can be so dangerous, especially if the police are pulling you over. Um, and then another thing I'll say is, um, from a police standpoint, I just think it really helps to be uh, connected with your community or at least to know someone that's connected in the community because connections do go a long way. I feel like that's how a lot of like people in power get things that they want. And I think that like if you are um, in Ypsilanti and you know someone that at the sheriff's office you at least have someone you trust that you can talk to about something if something does happen or you feel like that it was wrong um and uh i think that kind of goes a long way having those like trusted relationships um something i could think of the other thing is I'll, every police officer in washington county now does have the body cameras and that is something that just yeah, so they are supposed to have them turned on on scenes. <laughs> and they are automatic for certain things. Like if you hit your lights, they automatically come on. Um, certain things will trigger them to come on, whether they, you know, uh, they don't have to push the button kind of thing. But just be aware that A, you are being watched on a body camera when, you know, the police, I mean, there's a high probability that it's recording. So, um, and then also just know that that is there. And so if you do want to make a complaint, um, you can very well sit down and say you want to see the body camera footage. Um, can I ask a small question? Yeah. What do you do if you see the cop hit the button to cut the camera off, stop the tape, and tell his partner, hit your button, cut that? Now they go about doing what they do. Who you go to then? You say trust. There is no trust mm -hmm. when it comes from here to, I know you're not a cop mm -hmm. anymore, but from here to the cop, there's no trust. The life that I had and the experience that I have with the police, they showed me that we do what we want to do. This badge that I got on my chest right here say I can do whatever I want to to you and not get in trouble for it. So if we saw so what someone do you, to do that. What do we do so I, to fight against that? Because really, ain't no trust for you. Right, no, and, and I completely understand that. I will say, like, I know personally, my co I know people have gotten in trouble for this, for turning off their body cameras, because the cars also have cameras that aren't, you can't just, like, click the button kind of thing. The technology is almost getting there to a point where it is helping. It's not a be-all, end-all by any means. You can absolutely still turn it off, and there's still going to be problems. There's still going to be corruption, but it at least is a start, because before it was just audio, and you could just, I mean, the audio doesn't even show the video. Um, the other thing is, like, I mean, people do record on their phones and stuff. Um, I would just very, I'd just be, but be careful not to, like, get in it, you know, I would almost try to like stay back yeah. and not uh, be, be a problem with it. But I mean, I think that that does help. I mean, a lot of, especially nationally, the cell phones recording have changed law enforcement. The same brother-in-law, my husband said, got me to buy a dash camera for my car. He said, yeah. you keep that on at all times, take it out, download it, put it back, clean it, put it back in when it's full, always see that you never know. Mm -hmm. And it costs, what, like $49? So we have more rhymes to start with uh, Tommy. I knew if you would add um, just one, three. <laughs> so there's 618, and I want to be out of here That's by 630. So let's go. Yes. Is that the first? Uh, <laughs> okay, so. 620. Huh? It's 620. Yeah, so we're going to be out of here at 630. That's a promise, y'all.
So, advocacy from the church, all right? The Adventist church um, now has an Adventist social justice movement that is beginning. How can we, as the Ypsilanti church, engage in a level of advocacy, whether it be in-house, um, before, right, at a political sector, whatever it may be, just one thought as to what the church can do to impact the, you know, needle being moved towards a more fair and just system. Just one brief, and then we're gonna, one brief. I think we as a church, uh, could educate our people to know that there's a motivation for uh, incarcerating and locking up people, vulnerable people, especially if you are um, a minority. And we as a church, I, I think by feeding into our children, our church family, um, that they are aware that this prison industrial system is an investment and everything, it, just about everything you can think of is linked to it from buying toilet paper to toothpaste to making furniture to, I mean, everything you can think of pretty much, and I wanna be brief here, it's pretty much linked to this system. Uh, what I'll say next briefly, uh, we have Beef up prison ministry, go in, see them before they get out, build that relationship before they get out. Even whether they come here or not, they know that they are not throwaways and they can go out and potentially help others avoid the same situation. Well, I guess I'm a politician, so I'm supposed to say advocate politically. Uh, maybe Ed can say that for me. I wanna talk about, in, in the event we get good people in the prosecutor's office, uh, how, how, how we could work together to really transform the system. Um, one thing that there's an increased movement to doing, that the sheriff is committed to doing this, and, and I will be committed to doing this as prosecutor, is, is deflecting away criminal charges, especially for young people, especially for people that are dealing with substance abuse, mental health issues, not charging in the first place, but getting them the resources that they need. The thing is, we need community partners, like the faith community, uh, to provide some place for people to go. Right? And I think of this particularly for, for, for young people. The best thing mm -hmm. that we can do for young people is not to throw them into juvie, yeah. but to give them something productive to do, to let them uh, build real, sustained, authentic relationships with adults. That's what nudges them off the path. Yeah. So I would just ask uh, the church to you know, be, be a partner in that. And if we can work together, we can, really build, we can really change the system. It's not just gonna happen though from, from the inside. We need the whole community to, to, to work together to build the change that we need. The one thing I would say on all L's is know who your friends are, the folks that you surround yourself with because they're individuals that are gonna be around you that are not good for you, specifically because of the fact that you're not like your uh, friends who happen to be of a different complexion than you. So that's the thing you have to always keep in mind and make sure you're, all, like, you're aware that you're always being watched, that you are always being held to a higher standard in comparison to the rest of the people, or you should hold yourself to a higher standard, and you don't have the same privileges that other people do based on the color of your skin. And the last thing I would say is advocate and push for um, deflection and diversion programs in your uh, account, and really advocate for what you believe the criminal justice system should look like and just stand up for what you, the people want. And that's the thing that really is essential to this movement in of itself. So that's all I gotta say. Uh, yeah. First, you should have monthly panel like this, yeah. dealing with this situation every month. That's number one. Number two, you need to have someone in the church, one or two persons working with the precinct. So you develop that networking. Every month that you have the meeting, there should be a different person try to from the precinct coming to speak to your people so they get to know the face, you get to interact with them so that when you get in trouble on the streets, 
they will remember because you have developed their relationship over the months and the years. Thank you. I guess since I'm the last one, I get to go a little longer. <laughs> uh, first, let me begin by saying my apologies to um, every law enforcement officer that is represented in here. Um, when I made the statement that all police officers need to be arrested, that was not said in a literal sense. It was, I was talking about police accountability, and I hope you understand that. We need police officers. We need policing in our communities. I work with the Sheriff's Department. I work with police officers. So uh, that was not to be taken literally. So my apologies again, my brother. <laughs> um, my advice uh, uh, to young people when I counsel young people and when I, when I speak in the churches, uh, one of the statements that I always make is, we got to live to fight another day. If you get stopped by a police officer, it would behoove you to be respectful um, and just comply with the police officer's uh, orders. You're not going to win against a police officer on the side of the road. They have the full faith and authority of the state. That badge and that gun gives them the authority to do whatever they want to do on the roadside, whether it be legal or illegal. So it would behoove you to understand that and just comply with the orders of the police officers. Secondly, we need to make sure that we follow the rules. We follow the law. Why are you out there driving if you know your license is suspended? Why are you out there driving if you know you got all these warrants and all these issues? Just obey the law. That's what the Bible says. We need to obey and follow the rules. And thirdly, uh, my wife and I, we're doing our part. It's the last point. We're doing our part in ending the cycle of recidivism. Uh, we're not just talking to talk, but we're also walking to walk. We open up our, our homes. Uh, to ex-offenders coming out of prison. They stayed in our house. We have helped rehabilitate several people through our homes. And uh, we got to the point where we needed to take it outside and there was a judge who believed in our vision and they gave us a house to use in Georgia. Right now, we have a waiting list to get inside that house. We're working with the courts. We're advocating with the prosecutors and the judges. They know about our program. We can write a letter on behalf of an of a, 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 a inmate telling the judge, look, we want to take this person in our program, we're going to counsel them, we're going to make sure we hold them to accountability, and we're going to assist in the transmission of this person. And the judges are sending them to our house. We got um, uh, MOUs with a lot of the jails in Atlanta, Rockdale County, Newton County, DeKalb County Sheriff's Office, and we're getting these young men. The problem that we're having right now is that we get zero support from the church. The church is truly not interested in what we are doing. The church is not interested in this discussion right here. I'm telling you, I'll be honest with you, 100%. I'm speaking at different churches every single week. And it's not about this. It's not about uh, uh, um, providing information and resources to help the people. It's about taking from the people. That's what the church is doing. That's what society is doing. The same culture exists. And so uh, um, we can work together as a church by you know, starting transitional houses in these areas, supporting existing transitional houses. Like right now, I, I wish, you know, my wife and I, we're supporting the house that we have from our pocket. You're talking about eight to nine people in a house. You gotta feed house and, and provide services for eight people in a house. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, we're doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. By the grace of God, we're doing it every month. And we've been doing it for over a year now, uh, structured in that sense. And so we're looking for support. We're looking for people to support what we're doing. We, we got a waiting list trying to get in house. We need several more houses. It, we can get $3,000 a month from every single church in Adventism. We can have a hundred and something houses all over the place. You know how many lives can be transformed? Today, every single person in my house was in church. Every single person in my house, they're working. They've never been back to prison. Some of them have went on. Yeah, you can clap. Come on, give God some praise. This is the ministry that God has called us to. Not just my wife and I, the entire church, every single person in here. Amen. We got people in the Seventh-day Adventist. Let me, let me show you the hypocrisy, and I'm, I'm going to let you go. We have the Seventh-day Adventist church from the highest level. People are calling the conferences and asking, look, my son is in jail. Do you know anybody? And they're referring them to me. Why don't you do this yourself? You see what I'm saying? Why don't you go out at, or call me and ask me how we can duplicate what you're doing and let's structure this. Why you send them to me? And not even saying, well, I'm gonna write you a check along with a referral. No, so the church is celebrating what we're doing, but they're not supporting it. No. That's a travesty. We really want to end the cycle of racism. It starts with us changing the way that we think. Amen. 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 All right, we've had a hearty discussion. A lot to chew on, right? 
but I want to thank everyone for coming out today and for lending your voice and your expertise um, to this discussion. And I'm praying that with each day that our hearts and our minds become renewed um, because we have a work to do. We have a work. And as Chaplain Cox stated, you know, it starts here. Doug read a verse this morning and it spoke to, right, when I was homeless and when I needed food and I needed water, right, and when I was behind the bars, right, it's supposed to be us that's doing that work, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm praying that um, collectively as a church that we get to a space where that becomes our true mission. Amen. So, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Doug to come up and close us out with prayer. Um, before we end, our, our special guest, uh, Voices of Praise, <clears throat> I was informed that they have CDs available. Um, I don't know, did you all bring them with you today? Or is there a link that we could look at, maybe a CD baby or something of that nature, where we can bless the ministry? Anyone? Yeah, no, it's bad. <laughs> Very good. Okay, all right, so yes, so I got the nod. Um, so yeah, I'll have Doug to come up and do closing prayer, and then um, Eli will be at the door um, with some flyers as well regarding um, him running for a prosecutor. We're holding you accountable, Eli. Please do. We, we gotta got win you. first, but then please right. hold me accountable. And you, <laughs> and you gave a handshake. Now that is a bond, right? Forget cash bond, that's a bond right there. So, all right, Doug, please close us out.